All right, my friends, it's time to talk about the changing grammar of the early modern English language. This is the language of Shakespeare and Ben Jonson and John Milton and Emilio Lanier and the King James Bible. It's a language that has been memorialized for us as, as what we consider fancy English, but that was only one kind of, of early modern English. It was a language that everyone spoke in everyday life as well. And from the great range of texts that survived because of the explosion of print, we know a lot about it. And so we're going to learn a little bit about it right now. Um, first of all, there are some things from Middle English that continue. A lot of the processes and changes that we saw in Middle English, like such as inflection loss, the reduction in the complexity of the noun, pronoun, and verb system, that continues. That continues to happen. Um, and we'll, we'll talk we'll, we'll look closely at what some of those things. The great vowel shift continues, and I invite you to watch that, um, uh, the, click on that link in the optional resources on Shakespearean pronunciation. But uh, they did not speak, um, they did not pronounce their words precisely as we do today. And so, in fact, in uh, Shakespeare's sonnets, a lot of words that don't seem to rhyme to us did rhyme to them. Um, New, morphologi new morphological forms develop that don't survive in the present day English. Um, this is not this is a period uh, in which new there are new innovations, but not every innovation lasts. Uh, but ha any innovation has to be propagated, it has to be adopted, it has to stick. And so we get a lot of like kind of an explosion of different language forms because of all that survives, but not everything sticks. New word, a lot of new, and this includes words. There are tons and tons of new words that develop that don't survive in the present day English. We'll talk about that more in, in um, or you can learn more about that in the PowerPoint slideshow on the Inkhorn controversy. Um, we see a simplification of verb inflection and um, what we might call grammaticalization, and we'll define that a little later, but this. Um, has to do with the development of the modern way in which we use modal auxiliary words like can, may, should, will, might, etc. Um, so first let's talk about pronouns because pronouns are, you know, every just about every sentence has a, has a pronoun in it. Very important. First of all, the object case you replaces the subject case ye. So whereas in Chaucer it's ye go to the store, um, by Shakespeare's time, it's you go to the store, except in, in, in and this, again, this isn't, doesn't change overnight, and it changes in different places and in different contexts at a different rate, but this is a process that takes place. We also get a replacement by um, uh, thou, the singular familiar form, with a singular you. Um, and this is going on throughout the course of the early modern period. Um, again, it, in more formal contexts, the language changes slower. But the, in everyday speech by the early 1600s, thou would have been a little bit old-fashioned. Um, we also get the replacement of his by its in the early modern English neuter possessive. What? Wait, hold on a second. Um, what does that mean? So... Um, we, we'd say, okay, see that tree? His branches are waving. That would be the neuter form, but that gets replaced by its in early modern English. Um, the, the its is actually a new form that doesn't exist in early modern English. It's formed by analogy to it. Um, we get the development of reflexive forms. Myself, himself, yourself. Um, in Chaucer, you'd say, I, me, like, or he, him, saw in the mirror. But in the early modern period, we get the development of I, I like myself, he saw himself, etc. Um, and so the just a, a quick review of the second person pronoun system. Um, bef uh, we, we start out with the beginning of the early modern English period. Thou likest cheese, ye like cheese. I like thee, I like you. This is thy horse, this is your horse for the plural. Is this horse thine? Yes, I think this horse is yorn. Yes, I, this is a form that isn't widely attested everywhere, but it did exist. And if you've ever heard an old-time Ozarks person refer to something as hisn, um, that's, that's the same Elizabethan, early modern form of the possessive. 
So let's talk about nouns. Yeah, I love grammar so much. Um, one thing we see is the vanishing of the N plural, which you might know from children and oxen and not much brethren and not much else. Um, in many, many words, this goes away and it gets replaced just by the simple S form, such as the word iron becomes eyes, as in I have two iron in my head. Um, we also get a proliferation of what are called zero plural forms. We still have some of these in modern English, like deer and fish. You don't say fishes or deers, you say deer and fish, but these were far more common. We talked about, you know, they had 37 cannon or hand or pound or brick or sometimes ship. Um, where it were used. Uh, things that were um, sometimes like things that were technically countable but 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 often in great numbers would be used uh, in zero plural. Um, we see an increasing use of what are called adjunct nouns or noun noun clusters. Um, this is not something you see so much in Middle English at all but it starts exploding in early modern English. Um, a uh, food truck. These are two nouns, right? Hackney coach, business school, not the school of business, not the truck of food or the food is truck, um, or the car of clowns, clown car AIDS crisis. Um, but the, uh, but two nouns sort of put together. Now in modern German, these just get just combined into one word. So maybe there's, um, something of the old Germanic tendency towards compounding going on here. It's just not being specifically compounded. Um, and sometimes you get a compound of a compound, so, so mad cow, feed, scare. So mad cow's a noun, feed is a noun, scare is a noun, they're all getting clustered together. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, the ES, the genitive form in Middle English, be, um, becomes in print apostrophe S um, to indicate the possessive or the genitive. And the weird thing here is this is sometimes printed as his. So. Here's an example. Against the Countess Galley, I did some service. Now, some people say, is this because of H dropping? Where, where people would say it, this would be pronounced as is, as it still is in some dialects of, like, for example, London English. Um, uh, in, we see an, an edition of famous, very educated poet. Here doth lie Ben Jonson's poet, best piece of poetry. So is this just a, a weird way of writing out Ben Jonson's? Some people argue that this was actually um, something that can emerge in as an analytical um, form, an, an analytical instead of an inflected possessive. Um, we see this happen in modern Afrikaans, the dialect of Dutch spoken in South Africa, for example. Um, and you can see by analogy, the lady, her servant, right? Or, or, this, or as the same kind of analytical possessive. But we also see Mrs. Stafford, his... Uh, late, um, mis made written out. Um, so sometimes we see his attached to a woman. So it's a little bit unclear. It's kind of debated, but this is a kind of a weird form that you'll see in early modern English that will drop out later. We also see the emergence of what's called the group genitive. So as where Shakespeare would often write the Duke's niece of Gloucester, which means the Duke of Gloucester's niece. Um, we, we get this modern form where we get a genitive attached to a whole noun phrase rather than just a single noun. Um, an example of this is the writer's ambition of the book. It is, becomes the writer of the book's ambition. And this perhaps indicates why this is shifted because, because of the various ambiguities in the, genesis, uh, in the genitive. I'm actually going to cut this uh, video on grammar into two, into two, maybe three parts. So tune in to so follow the next one on adjectives and adverbs and verbs.